I learned about race when I was a child. How did you learn about that? Well, I lived on a farm that had been a station on the Underground Railroad. In the north, then? In the north, in mm -hmm. Bucks County. Uh -huh. Yes, I have completely northern yeah. ancestry, and my grandfather fought in the Civil War, yeah. and on the northern side. Mm -hmm. And we bought a farm with a station on the Underground Railroad. This was good and romantic, good northern behavior. And we had two old men in the neighborhood who'd been slaves, but who'd dropped off and hidden and yeah. stayed there. One of them had a young wife. He must have been 70, I suppose, when I was a child. Mm -hmm. It was a long time before. But he had a young wife, very fat young wife. And she had a half-white son. And what I was told by my mother, who mm -hmm. believed in telling children the truth, and telling it correctly so they wouldn't get it wrong, that she'd been raped by a white man. I had the reverse picture that most Americans had, you see, because most white women, picture of rape is a black man. I mm -hmm. mean, this is one of the important things one has to remember all yeah, the time. Yeah, this is very funny, no. You know, but I <coughs> got reversed, and my picture of rape was a black woman raped by a white man. Yeah. He was a butcher, too. Yeah. And that, that's one of those <coughs> accidental things, and he was a brutal character. So that whenever I dreamt of rape, I mean, I always yeah. knew mother insisted on our calling her Mrs. Stewart. Remember, mm. this is 1912. Yeah, wow. And uh, she, whenever she cropped up in a dream, I knew what I was dreaming about. Yeah. You see. But now this is a straight reversal of, yeah, of ordinary American experience. That's right. The, Ameri the ordinary American mythology is, is, in, is entirely yeah. different. I suppose that explains a lot, of, a lot about you. Now, I'm not completely free. I don't think any American, any white American, is free of a special attitude towards American Negroes. Yeah. Just as you're saying that, you know, mm -hmm. there aren't any Negroes outside America. That's you right. Know, we're yeah. nice to other people's yeah. cities, or we're f we treat e African princes or Indians yeah. with yeah. turbans or something mm -hmm. very well. My first field trip was to Samoa. Well, of course, you know, Polynesians are people everybody thinks is beautiful. And if you look at them very closely, they are not really the most beautiful people in the world. And yet everybody thinks they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. Chinese think so. Black people think so. Everybody thinks so. I've now figured out why. That for maybe two or 3,000 years, they never saw anybody but themselves. And they think they're beautiful, and they're so and impressed yeah. with themselves yeah. that everybody else thinks they're beautiful. Because if you think you're beautiful, you move. Like in a, a certain person. way, yes. Just consider for a minute if we never invented boats. Yes, where would England we, be? <laughs> well, no, yeah. if we never invented boats, we wouldn't have the problems we have today. But yeah. if everybody had to walk, yeah. because they couldn't walk very far in a lifetime, they'd stop and, and make love yeah. to the local girls. Yeah. And as we gradually, they uh, would have moved from Africa over mm. Europe, yeah. getting paler and paler, <coughs> but it would take them thousand years. Yes, that's right. And by the time they got to Sweden, they got those pale blue eyes and thinned out there so that they could get what sun there was because there wasn't much there. Yeah, that's right. Now, it would have taken thousands of years and it would have been imperceptible. Yes, that's true. From the blackest group in Africa all yeah. the way up to the blondest people up in Scandinavia. Helsinki, yeah. But you see what happened was boats. And people were always taking boats and tearing around things and putting people side by side that were contrasted so sharply. People have talked a lot of in this country. One of the things I'm not sure of is, is what are the things that are worth discussing anymore. But in one way, you and I belong to the same generation and yes, we're pre-war. Yes, that's and true. And these were the things we're age. Yeah. These are the things mm -hmm. that we talked about and thought about. And they used to say children don't have any race prejudice. We heard that till the cows yes, screamed. You've got to be taught all to learned. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't. You've got to be taught to hate, but the appreciation and fear of difference mm -hmm. is everywhere. That's right. And I've seen, you know, plenty of people in this country have seen a white child who got used to black face and black hands, and then somebody took off their shirt, and they screamed because they sort of thought that this black face and black hands belonged to a white body. Yeah. But yeah. I've seen a black child do the same thing with a white man. Scream I've seen that with too. fear. You know, because it is a conspicuous difference between being very blonde. I mean, I'm using the blonde Swede and the yeah. mm -hmm. blackest people mm -hmm. for a contrast. Mm -hmm. And that in, in New Guinea would mean Solomon Islanders that are blue, literally. 
And they scream with fear when they see white people just as much as white people mm -hmm. scream with fear because the contrast was too great. Yeah. So what we did in this earth with ships, you could go somewhere and you could pick up people and take them somewhere else. And as a result, we've got these tremendous contrasts that tried the souls of people, I think. You see. Yeah. I think you've got to realize one other thing about white people, and that is that white skin is a terrible temptation. I didn't mean that exactly. I think I know what because you mean. Because we that. look like angels. Did you know that? Uh, yeah, I was going to get to that. I was, go on. You see, when those angles of Anglo-Saxons yeah. were taken to Rome to be sold as slaves, and were being sold as slaves in the marketplace, and a pope came along, remember, and looked at yeah. these slaves, and he said, what are they called? And somebody said, angles, and he said, oh, not angles, angels. Now, that yeah. meant that way back <coughs> And Christianity was a Mediterranean religion at that point. Yes, that's right. It's, it's not but weird. angels were white. Yeah. The dead, you see, are white everywhere because mm. the bones are white. And mm. people associate the dead with skeletons, and then you have ghosts, and then you have angels, and they're all white everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, now you get some people coming along. You know, they're when also the, white. When the first white people landed in Australia, the Australian Aborigines thought they were the ghosts of their ancestors coming back. When uh, Cortez landed in Mexico, he was greeted as the fair god. Not a fair god. No. There had never been any white people there. This was a dream of the dead. Now, it is not good for people's character yeah, to, be identified with to angels. look like angels. And yeah. it makes them behave very badly. But the root of it is somewhere there, isn't it? Yes, it I think me. so, you see. And that and that's deeper, I suppose, isn't it? Even that's than terribly, terribly deep. I even think, than churches, even. But you know, there's something else about it, too. And that is, it makes a difference whether you say white or light or bright. Yeah. It's funny, they all run. You see, I've lived in a place where there wasn't any fire, unless you made it with a little piece of wood, you know, a little yeah. fire plow. And people guarded fire very hard. And in such a place, there's nothing at night but the little embers of a fire, and you're terribly afraid. You can't make light. You mm -hmm. can only make a little spot of light in the darkness. And so people have been afraid of the night. Which and is also identified with what? With death? With danger. With danger, yes. With danger, with terrible danger. The themes come out in the night when there's no moon. Of course, mm -hmm. when there's moon, it's lovely. Then you can dance all night. But when there's no moon, the thieves get you and mm -hmm. anything can get you, and you don't know what. Mm -hmm. Now, I think electric light's going to get rid of that one. Now, our mm -hmm. children aren't afraid of the dark, mm -hmm. not the ones who've lived in the city, yeah, on the whole, right. with electric lights. They press a button, and the world's flooded, and they don't ever have to grow up with the fear of the dark. Yeah, all that is very gloomy in a way, because it means that it's to be a very, very long time before we have conquered what is essentially a tribal, isn't it? Tribal? But it's before tribal. Before tribal, see, this really. Is before it's pre tribal, tribal. Really. This is, you know, just people's feeling about the way they look themselves. When you get the contrast between black and white, the white people were, or the light ones. I've seen now, there was an albino in Samoa, and they used to call her my sister. She looked just <laughs> like me. You know? And yeah. people who were born, and there's a strain of people in Samoa that have honey colored hair. And uh, fathers used to grow their daughter's hair and sell it for wigs. They were made, and everybody, everybody made wigs of this red honey colored hair. This went way back before there were any white people there at all. And everywhere one goes, you find this contrast. Now, when it's a little contrast, it doesn't matter, you know, but when it's a big contrast, Yes, I mean, nobody knows, I mean, no, nobody knows anything at all about where they come from, really. You know, that's why we have some... You know, I noticed you used the word, uh, something about dark deeds. Yes, that's right, that's right, yeah. yes. You obviously, you know... Uh, You're speaking, writing English. I'm, right, I'm right. working in the English language, yes. But you yes. find it also in African languages, you see. That's the thing that is so strange. Or else not. Because what you're saying... Well, I mean, I'm saying it's, it's, uh, it's understandable that this association of, you know, white and good and ghosts, and all these things. Yeah. Now, there, uh, there are other people. You said you, Tucson, is that the name of the, the psychiatrist? That, uh, Tucson. 
Poussin. Poussin. Yes, I'm always getting his first letter wrong. Now, he makes a great deal about black and dirt. Yes, I know that Mr. Cartridge does, But I don't think that's nearly as important. I think it's brightness and darkness and the fear of the dark. My little girl said once, what's fear? What does it mean to be afraid? Because she had never recognizably be afraid. And I took her by the hand and stood in the doorway of a totally dark room. I said, now you look in there. And that's what people mean when they say they're afraid. So I think that one has to consider that white people to Europeans, and this is all Europeans, I mean, just as, as you've recognized in your books, all Europeans have a deadly temptation to a sense of superiority. What this comes close to suggesting is that one of the reasons for the riddle of white supremacy is involved with some, really some universal impulse. It is not merely an historical... The universal perception. Yeah, it is not, really, not merely an historical or theological uh, aberration, let's say. But comes out of something very profound in, in everybody's nature. In everybody's nature. That's a weird um, and frightening perspective, isn't it, in a way? It can be eliminated now that we don't need to be afraid of the dark. Of course, we, yes, but we've got so many other things to be afraid of. Yes, but just the same. Yeah, but I see what you mean. It, if brightness is mm -hmm. something everybody can have from the time they're born. Yeah, I see what you mean. But it'll be a very long time before brightness is become something everybody can have from the day they're born. Well, we're moving that way. Most people have acquaintance with electric lights. You don't know what it means to, to even know there was such a thing. Even know that you could have a light that would light anything. A bunch of coconut beans doesn't light anything. It just makes a spot, but doesn't illuminate. doesn't illuminate. There's no illumination. And white people are, in, in some sense, in a kind of tragic case. Yes, but you see, I think that... Uh, and it's a point you, you also make, of course, that in any oppressive situation, both groups suffer, the oppressor and the oppressed. Yes. Now, the oppressed suffers more physically. They're frightened, they're abused, they're poor, or whatever. But the oppressor suffers more morally. Yes, which is the worst kind of suffering okay. because it's... Because they have to deny something in themselves. Yes, that's right. One's got to disengage oneself from any kind of sentimentality because one's got to try to understand what is really happening in this century. And of course, the greatest sentimentality, which, which both black and white people have shared for years, is that black people are somehow different than white people. We are different in some ways. But alas, one level on which people are not different, and that's the level on which they're wicked. There again, you can say, you know, that all men are brothers, really. You know, one's got to be very as clear headed about that as possible because. Otherwise, you fall into another trap altogether. No, I think there's a difference in, in wickedness in different cultures, you know. For instance, when the <coughs> English get angry, they get <coughs> colder and colder and colder. Yes, it's true. Now, when Americans get angry, black or white, they don't get colder. No, they get hotter. They get hotter. Yeah. And they yell. That's true. And there's a real difference. When the Irish get angry, they're in love. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I used to watch it with my child, who we shared a household with a family where the wife was Irish, and uh, she treated my daughter beautifully, but she didn't love her quite as much as she did her own son. And she was beginning to learn that anger and love are the same thing, you know, which mm -hmm. she wasn't supposed to love, but learn, because she wasn't Irish after all. Mm -hmm. You know, and Kipling's where there are, there's loving and fighting, and when mm -hmm. we stop, either tis Ireland no more. So there is really a difference, even in anger, between one group and another. Now, one thing I'd like to ask you about is the whole role of touch, you see. Oh, yeah, yeah. It seems to me, I mean, the average middle-class American is exceedingly inhibited about touching other people. He's frozen, nearly. Frozen, they maybe shake hands. Even that is done nervously. You know, they don't really enjoy it. And, uh, <laughs> um, now, my general experience in working with black people is that you always have to touch them. Oh, yeah. That if you don't touch them, you haven't communicated with them at all. You can sit across the room and make beautiful speeches no, we forever. All grow, we all and grow one that way. touch yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. Just one touch. I don't know why that is. I remember, I remember once in Africa, though, somebody said to me, I, was, I watched the way African women carried their babies. You know, they wrapped it, you know, wrapped it in 
this thing on their on their backs. And somebody said, you know, that it's almost the key to, you know, to, to African psychology because all the baby's got to do is knock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 and you can't it's see it, you see. You yeah, that's right. It. You can only feel it, and you and you, and you react to the way its movements, mm -hmm. you know, to the way it's. Uh, but that's a very subtle thing, isn't it? It is not typical of life in the West. It's typical of the life I lived. You know, we all grew up on top of each other, you know, slapping each other or kissing each other or whatever. But it was, we always touch each other, and so we have. Well, all you know, the we all touch everybody else then too. Touch. One of the great inhibitions of you know one of the great terrible things about middle class black people. And you see this at their parties sometimes, years and years ago. You go to somebody's, you know, rather elegant, upper-class, middle-class uh, party, and everybody there would be absolutely, you know, they were ghastly parties, because everybody was being even more rigid than any Englishman or any American could be, because they were, as I said before, you know, they were learning tricks. And then about 2 o'clock in the morning, if you could stay that long, you know, somebody would break down, <laughs> and, you know, and presently, you know, doesn't everybody end up in the kitchen? <laughs> no, like, you know, after all the stiffest black people had gone home, and the hostess or hostess, you know, we go in the kitchen, break up, break up some chicken, and and take off our shoes, and revert to our savage ways. <laughs> well, you know, one of the important things, it seems to me, very important things in this country, is when black people touch white people freely. And this is yeah. what has happened now. I mean, you may feel, you know, that everything's gotten worse. Oh, I'm, I'm not that simple-minded, I walk around minded, the world actually. as a white person. And now, and my sister says the same thing, and she's taught in Harlem and taught all over New York City, that now she's sometimes laying with a cane. And a black man will take, take her arm and take her, take her across the street. That's always been true in America, I think. No, the initiative to touch, yeah. you see. There always was reserve. There always was a line that might be dangerous. This is a stranger. This is taking yes, that's stranger. True. That's true. Strangers who will, will move out. And I think it's just as important, you see, one way as the other. That it is, is that the black people have to feel perfectly free to touch white people. Well, for a very long they don't touch people, they're not human. Yeah, that's true. Not to not touch a person is a way of rejecting it, yeah. really. And it's, a way, and it's a way also of being rejected. I remember when I was young, much younger, when I was in junior high school and, and also in the pulpit, I went through great traumas at one, one point in my life because I was about 14. And on subways, you know, I was always taught by my mother, you know, you always stand up and give your seat to a woman. But some of the preachers told me I should never stand up and give my seat to a white woman. And this gave me a tremendous conflict for a while because somehow standing up for a white woman would have seemed to be an act of civility. I solved this problem very neatly by never sitting down on the subway. <laughs> but, but it was traumatic because I had to think about it all, I had to think it through for myself, whether the woman's color was more important than her, the fact that she's a woman. But I think that every black person must have, must have gone through that at one level, especially a black man. Because it'd be a black, that's another aspect of this whole thing, which no one is, you know, which has been suggested by many people, but it's never really, really been a profondi. You know, it's never really been dealt with exceedingly complex situation that a black boy grows into a man, finds himself in, in this country. His sexuality is menaced in the moment his eyes open on the world. And the only person who really knows anything about that, who knows it m most intimately, is also the most dangerous figure in his life, who is his mother. His father, for the most part, well, first of all, it's his father, and the father has another relationship to a kid anyway. It's not something his father can do very, very much about. Because it was his man in his manners, and he's, fa you know, he's facing knives every day, partly to feed the child. So it evolves upon the mother to invest the child, her man-child, with some kind of interior dignity which will protect him against something from which he really cannot be protected unless he has some interior thing within him to meet it. I know in my own experience, I did a lot of dodging and sidestepping, you know, but I had to do a great deal of frontal attacking too. And part of it, you know, part of the great dilemma was, was uh, how in the world, first of all, to treat black women, because when I was growing up, one was very ambivalent about being black at all. One knew nothing about oneself. This is not my fault. You know, the, the schools I went to, the books I read, the people I knew didn't know anything about themselves either. And to find out about myself, I'd make, do several difficult things. But how to, how to deal with a, a black girl whom you knew you couldn't protect? 
unless you were prepared to go into the post office, unless you were prepared to make bargains, which I was temperamentally unfitted to do. And even then it wouldn't have worked, because it didn't work. You see that all around me. And I could see the price that some black people paid, some great black men paid, you know, but they, they were quite extraordinary and very, very difficult men. Nobody in his right mind was going to say a word to them uh, on any Tuesday unless he wanted to die. But I, you know, I wasn't good to do that either. And then there's a great problem of white women who come to you for the most part as though you're some exotic, extraordinary phallic symbol. Yes, as if no. you're nothing but a phallus. As, as, as if you're absolutely nothing but, you know, you didn't have a, a head. walking phallus, didn't really. Have a head. You know, no head, no arms, no nothing, you know, just... Mm. Uh, and of course, you can do that for a while. Actually, the act of love becomes an act of murder, in which you are also committing suicide. In my case, I simply split the scene completely, you know, went to another country, just went to another country about five minutes before I was carried off to Bellevue. Because I, you know, I could tell by what, what happened to me when I got to France. I got to France, and everything came pouring out. I started breaking up bars, knocking down people. <laughs> you know, <I've> been <laughs> I spent a year in Paris tearing up the town. Of course, I got torn up too. Ended up finally in jail. Even while I was doing it, I realized what was happening. I couldn't stop it. But I knew it had to all finally to come out. Finally, at the end of 1949, when I was, I'd had it. I was flat on my back and kind of humiliated with myself. I knew I'd been very badly behaved. But it was over. The trap is, if you're born in that, in that situation, the nature of the trap is that you, without even knowing it, acquiesce. You've been, ta you've been taught that you're inferior, and so you act as though you're inferior. And on a level which is very difficult to, to, to get at, you, you really believe it. And of course, all the things you do to prove you're not only really prove you are. They're boomerang. Yes, if you're paying you know, attention. You know, you know really. Because yeah. you're working you're working a game which has, been run, which has been run down on you. You're playing the game according to somebody else's rules, and you can't win until you find the rules and, you know, and step out of that particular game, which is not worth, after all, playing. You know, I thought it would be worthwhile to think a little bit about the parallelism between race and sex and where it is and where it isn't. Ralph Bunch and I used to laugh because there were parts of the Cosmos Club he couldn't go in, there were parts I couldn't go in. They were both prejudiced against both of us. Now, the thing that women's lib are talking about at the moment, of course, is that women have accepted a male version of themselves. Yeah. And when you're talking about writing, what language you're going to write in? Well, you can be Elizabeth Barrett Browning yeah. and r write, you know, teach me only teach love. Yeah. As I yeah. ought, let me speak thy speech, love. Yeah, yeah. Think thy thought, yeah. oh. where the apple reddens never pry, lest yeah. we lose our Eden, Eve and I. I mean, the whole of Elizabeth Barrett Browning is yeah. just acting out what Robert's name? notion of her. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's, and then, yeah. that's true. But then you get Olive Schreiner struggling with images that are mm -hmm. really yeah. well, feminine and not doing it very well because she had to take her whole life for a part yeah and work on developing new images because they weren't there in the literature yeah that's right for her that's what black people have to do too and there is that that kind of relationship of accepting using a language that wasn't written wasn't well, made for you wasn't written with you in mind mind you know and you've simply got to you force the language to pay attention to you in order to in order to exist in it you know, and you have no choice but to exist in it because you're not really, That's you know, all the 30, 30 million of us are not going to learn Swahili or Yoruba. No. no. And, and in any case, we need the English language to do all the things which have yet to be done in this terrifying century. But the whole race-sex thing is probably in that area where, you can lo where one can locate the microbe, but it is almost impossible to do. Both areas are so inaccessible to, to, to the memory, first of all, and so wounding to the ego that you had to go through extraordinary excavations, you know, with your own shovel and your own guts, to be able to come anywhere near the truth about the connection between your rage, for example, and your sexuality. Well, you your know, passivity think, and your sexuality. I think this no. is what's happening with women's lib. Maybe one could say that there's a, the kind of parallel, she, that in a sense, the young black man in this country who's angriest is the one who's had the most opportunity, in a way. Well, that, that, but that's, but that's, that's another way of it, saying that the one who feels most cheated. Yes, so that he mm -hmm. feels most cheated. Yeah. Well, you see, women have been educated just like boys, theoretically. Yeah, but of course, I don't think that's really possible. But they've tried it. Yeah. See, they've gone yeah. to school, and they wore blue jeans, and, and they went to school with boys, and they were given the same education. And then it's as if, you know, you said to a man, um, 
what are you going to be? And he said, well, I think I'll be a lawyer unless I get married. What do you mean? Unless, unless you get married. But if yeah. I get married, I'll have to have a chicken farm. Well, why do you have to have a chicken farm? It's so good for children to be brought up on a chicken farm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and this is the kind of thing <coughs> that now it's, I wonder also it's, it's worth saying because you're talking about what the mother gave the yeah. black boy. Now, the women who are angry are the f women of fathers who've destroyed their femininity, you see, who have yeah. destroyed them as people yeah. by laughing at them as women. Yeah, yeah, by patronizing them. Patronizing them and laughing at them and saying it's a pity and they're their little girl. And, uh, of, course, of course, I think, th I th I think it's a symptom of a much deeper kind of uh, distress. One of the things that's happening in the century is not only the uh, tremendous upheaval caused by the history of the concept of color, but it's also something that's happening now between the sexes. It's been happening now for a long time, I think. But now it's something is happening more overtly, difficult to, to difficult to articulate. But the relationship between the sexes, which apparently has never really been as uh, fixed as everyone as everyone always so claimed, is now very definitely in a state of flux. Men and women are both reacting to it because it is very difficult now for a man to know exactly what the terms are to which he's to be related to a woman, and very difficult for her to know what terms she's to be related to him. And, f and the institution of marriage, though people don't like to think so, is abruptly becoming, I think, obsolete, because it is no longer necessary for the perpetuation of... It's necessary to bring up the children still. Well, many people don't agree with that. Well, whatever they call I it. tend to agree with that. I think there has to be some kind of unit some kind of, for the perpetuation of, the, you know, in fact, for, to protect the child. But I don't think it will be precisely what it has been here before. Well, what, it will, what it will what be, I don't it, know. What has it been here before? It's been every kind of thing that you can imagine. Yes, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Yes, so that I think, I think we'll still have the family to bring up children. What about the social estates? Social estates all have the family. My goodness, the Russian family is one of the most conventional families in the world. It is. Yes. It's rather reassuring, You know, divorce is terribly hard to get. Yeah. They found they couldn't get the kind of character they wanted without yeah. the family. Without the, so they went without the mother. Without, without the, the mother, mother and, and the father. father. Without yeah. the mother and the father. And they went back. And they blame the mother and father for everything that goes wrong. With the child. Yeah. yeah. Socialists in Russia. Yeah. The parents get blamed for everything that goes wrong and the party gets complimented for everything that goes right. <laughs> you know, people are making these p points. I mean, the black revolution and the women's revolution and the youth revolution. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably important to see where they, where they are relevantly related and where they're not. Now, as far as youth is concerned, everybody's going to get over it. Uh, yes, it's that's very, true. It's very trying while you're in it. Yeah. Everybody's going to get older if they live. Yes, that's right. The youth revolution is, is, I don't, well, I hate to sound that, I don't want to sound patronizing. I don't, I lived through one youth, you know, I was, I was young too, and, and it wasn't very different in a way from what, from the, at least the superficial symptoms of being young now. There is one thing, as we, we were discussing this the other night, you, something you brought up. There is a great difference, difference between born, being born in 1924 and being born after 1945. Oh, there's a, there's a generation gap in the world yeah, now. Yes. It's, uh, that caught the youth, but they're getting older now. Yeah, but they're getting older according to terms of which didn't exist when we were young. That's right. And we don't really know what those terms but are. But that isn't really about youth. You see, no. that's about people. And yeah. Ten that's years a, that, from now, they'll be 35. Yeah, but they will still be living under the shadow of, you know, of extinction. We weren't, we weren't born under that shadow. I don't know. We, you know we weren't, our minds weren't formed. Our minds weren't formed in the shadow of what is an effect an enormous betrayal. You know, if I were young, and if I, had, if I were born after, after Hiroshima, by the time I was 15, I would have judged my elders very mercilessly indeed, because the world in which I was born, and whether or not the kid is right is not important, is the world for which his parents are responsible. Yeah, and what they have done is betray him and betray his future. Now, wait a minute. Now, let's just work on this point of All responsibility, right. because it also fits into all this, all these guilt statements. Now, you know, you have different ways of looking at guilt. Yes. You get the Eastern Orthodox faith. Everybody shares the guilt of creatureliness. And yeah. uh, people share 
guilt for anything they ever thought. Now, your Western Northern European position and your Northern American position on the whole is that you're guilty for things that you did and not for things that other people did. I'm not talking about the kind of, the, the kind of cosmic um, guilt for the human race. Actually, I, I meant that if I were a, a child of this century, I would judge my elders very harshly, and as I said, whether, whether, whether I would be wrong or right is, is scarcely at this moment relevant, because this is the world that my elders have created. This is the world that they've created, but and this is the future. one generation of them didn't create it. No, it of course, created, created into the future. One generation of them didn't create it. No, it of course. It was created by hundreds of Yes, generations. of course, of course, of course. But a boy of 15 does not have that perspective, does he? In the days of the civil rights movement. Martin discovered this himself when he finally went to Chicago. You know, that there was a whole generation of black people whom he, he, he was completely unable to touch because their lives, the lives of a black boy in Chicago, was so much different from the life of a black boy in Montgomery, so much more fragmented and in so many ways so much more bitter because it was so much more devious that to say to that kid, we shall overcome, or to say to that kid that, you know, with patience, time will do this or that, was absolutely meaningless. The boy was, you know, the boy was standing on a street corner looking at his friends dying on the needle, possibly dying on the needle himself, he certainly had a friend in jail, certainly had a girlfriend on the block, certainly knew the reasons for the lives led by his mother and his father and, the, and all of that. And you couldn't go to a 16, 15 year old, 17 year old boy and say anything to him at all, except you know, try to teach him something that he himself really wanted to learn. What you had to do was deal with him as though he were a valuable human being because no one had ever treated him with any value, though he had any value. Finally, they began to do it themselves. That's how we got the Blackstone Rangers. That's how we, also, and it, that's how we finally got the Black Panthers. Because they could no longer turn to my generation for anything at all. They had to turn to themselves. And therefore, in some sense, immobilize those members of my generation which, who were against them and enlist the aid of those members of my generation who understood or tried to understand what it meant to be in their shoes. And, and also to understand that in fact, in fact the fact that I'm 25 years older, I'm still in their shoes. Because the, the police in this country do not make any distinction between a black panther, you know, or, or a black lawyer, or my brother, or me. The cops aren't going to ask my name before I pull the trigger. I'm part of this society. And I'm in exactly the same situation as any other black person in it. And if I don't know that, you know, that I'm, I'm fearfully self-deluded. What I'm trying to get at is a question of responsibility. I didn't drop the bomb either, you know, and I didn't, you know, I never lynched anybody. But uh, I am responsible not for what has happened, but I am responsible for what can happen. Yes, well, that's different, you see. I think the responsibility for what can happen, which is, on a sense, is good guilt which is mm -hmm. a sort of a nonsensical term, you know? Yeah, but, but I know what you mean. But it's good It's useful guilt. guilt. You that's can do something with it. Yeah. You see, that is, the th I am going to, to make an effort to have things change. Yeah. But to take responsibility for something that was done well, you can't, by others, yeah, you can't not do oneself. That. Yeah, but, uh, but again, I, just, just to belabor the point into the ground, it took me a long time to realize that my father was not responsible for my condition. But in the beginning, I thought, you know, obviously you judge the person next to you, you know, the, the nearest person. And many black people still blame their ancestors for getting on those boats at all. And of course, that's, that's preposterous. But it is part of the journey that but everybody see, in equally, one way makes. I think it's equally preposterous. I mean, it's preposterous to blame one's ancestors. It's preposterous for you to blame your black ancestors who got on those boats or sold, sold somebody yeah. who got on those boats. It's equally preposterous to blame the white men who were slavers there. That is, to blame them for what's happening now. Because yeah. they were living in a situation. They were living within a, within a certain framework and a set of principles. Now, I'm perfectly willing to take your point that for a 15-year-old boy in Harlem, nothing matters except what? Mm -hmm. His immediate life, of course. And, uh, and, and there's nothing you can offer him. You offer him $10 and he won't do a job because there's not going to be another 10 mm -hmm. There's nowhere where he can see that he will ever get anywhere. And he will so have any far. control over his own destiny. Any control at all. And that's the most demoralizing thing that it's there is. Horrible. The most terrible thing you can do to a person yeah. is that. And so we have this, of course, we not only have it uh, in Harlem, we also have it in the village with white boys. You go out and you offer them $10 to shovel the snow off the front of your house yes, and they right. won't take it. 
Yes, and right. people say, of course, this is so terrible. But I know why they don't take it. Because what's $10? Yeah. Unless mm -hmm. you're an addict. Yeah. Then you want $10 this minute. And then you want another $10 yeah. in a few hours. But otherwise, what's $10? Nothing. You're never, never, never going to get where you've seen people could go. And no. so, and, you know, so I'm not saying I don't understand your 15-year-old boy a bit. I do understand him. But at the same time, we're going to have to we're going to have to build a country. Yeah, but we're going to do it according to premises, which at this moment of the country are considered absolutely treasonable, for a radical example. I agree with the Black Panther position about black prisoners. I think, I think one can make an absolutely blanket statement that no black man has ever been tried by a jury of his peers in America. And that, uh, um, if that's so, and we know that is so, that no black man has ever received a fair trial in this country. And therefore, though I have under no illusions about the reasons many black people in in prison, I'm not saying there are no black criminals, I still agree that all the prisoners should be, should be released and then retried according to principles more honorable and more just. You see what I mean? Yeah. But of course, that, no, that, that is not about to happen next Wednesday, is it? I you know. don't think so. You, no. know. <laughs> you know, there's a new point now. <coughs> Most grand jurors, you can't serve on a grand jury until you're over 25. I didn't so know that. They're making the point that when you try an 18-year-old, yeah. he's not being tried by his peers. Yeah. This is the case I've just made in Wisconsin. Well, because th they actually have a law against his peer being <laughs> yeah. on the jury. Yes, that's see. right. And that's of right. course, no woman's ever tried by her peers either. Yeah, that's, that's true, too. But in fact, we don't do very well with peers. There weren't, aren't any peers in this country. There anyway, weren't except yeah. white, middle-class Protestant men. They're the only people in the yeah. country that aren't spelled with a capital. That's and right. That's right. You know, and now they're talking about wasps that get spelled with a capital. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. We very, very slowly gotten anywhere where we had. I mean, peers were sort of left over from the barons of running. Yeah, that, yes. And we all but, had our hopes, but we didn't have it really happen. No, it didn't, it didn't. It actually didn't happen, did it, in this country at all, really? No. Well, it moved along slowly, but after all, it was a long time before yeah. we got rid of a poll tax. Long yes, time before women no, got the no. boat, and now we're just going to give 18-year-olds the boat, and we're moving pretty slowly compared with what we thought we, we were told we were in school. Yeah, compared with all of that jazz. I would say this, though, for black Americans, at the risk of sounding chauvinistic, and, and even knowing what I know. I've watched, in, now for 22 years, I've watched black Americans, you know, Americans abroad, and on balance, I really have to give the uh, give the uh, black American a kind of accolade, in spite of all his hang-ups and all his you know and all his pretensions. Because sometimes and very often, and and more often than happens with white people, a black American will find himself, let's say, in Milan or in Rome, you know, or in Turkey, and will really be curious about the people. Most white Americans travel in a kind of um, plastic case, which is designed to prevent anything from ever happening to them. You know, the kind of magic plastic case out of which they produce, they fried think, you know, bacon fried eggs, breakfast. bacon, and good American coffee. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know. But a black American will very often, more often than a white American, I don't, I don't say always, really try to find out what's happening with the people. He'd be curious and try this and try that and drink something awful tasting. But he will really, you know, and the people respond to him differently than they respond to white Americans. And what I'm trying to get at is that I've always equated the American terror of dealing with me as a human being, dealing with Sambo. I watched it, in Amer I watch it all over the world now, in Americans, and the way they treat other people. They're just as afraid of the Greek and the Turk, and the Japanese, and even the French, as they are of me. I mean, what I'm saying is that their sense of reality, the American sense of reality, and the American sense of the world, has been somehow hopelessly inhibited by the attempt to get away from something which is really theirs. You know, I really belong to them and they really belong to me. And the level of human experience which they've always denied has had a disastrous effect on their sense of what is going on around them. I know what you so mean. So they don't, don't understand the Turks when the Turks hit the streets any more than they understood Birmingham when the blacks hit the streets. They don't yet know until the day how it is that Japanese students were able to stand, you know, to, to prevent Eisenhower from landing in Japan. A while, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, Turkish students lined up on the Bosphorus and forbade the Sixth Fleet to enter, to land, drove them out. The Americans don't know that, but I know why. 
And one of the very important things I think you've done is to keep on saying, after all, you are an American. Well, I'm not anything else. I yeah. discovered I was an American when I got off the boat in France. I was an American at the, at the age of 24. For the very first time in my life, I became an American in a foreign country because I was not anything else. And it was a great shock. It was a tremendous, tremendous revelation. I became an American, you know, when I was at 24. And I realized what it meant, both for better and for worse. That experience, and again, I'm speaking not exactly in my own person, that experience really has said something of the utmost importance about the moral life of the West, both again for better and for worse. The whole question, for example, of religion it really upsets me. I've never been able to understand, for example, and I was raised in the church, and I let, what saved me in that, indeed was I was raised in the church and I left it when I was 17 and never joined anything else again. <laughs> Not even a riding academy. <laughs> Nothing. I remember the photographs of white women in New, in New Orleans several years ago during the school integration crisis who were standing with their babies in their arms and in the name of Jesus Christ they were spitting on other women's children who happened to be black with their babies in their arms and I've never been able to understand that. I don't understand at all to put it in primitive, rather exaggerated primitive terms I don't understand at all what the white man's religion means to him. I know what the white, white man's religion has done to me. I could accuse the white Christian world of being nothing but a tissue of lies, nothing, nothing but an excuse for, for, for power, of being, as being as removed as anything can possibly be from any sense of worship and still more from any sense of love. I cannot understand that. No, and I really mean that. I really mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not joking when I say I cannot understand it, because I, I can have a fight. No, I can even have a fight with you. But I can't have a fight with a baby, with a child. That is a photograph from the Second World War, which stays in my memory forever. And it's a little Jewish boy, about five or six. And by the time I saw this photograph, he was dead. And the Gestapo just surrounded him. He was standing in the street, looking down at his shoes, a beautiful little boy. And he looked the way you look, you know, the little boy has peed on himself. You know, he just, just didn't know what had happened to him. And they were going to take that boy away and kill him because he was a Jew. And this is in the name of Christianity. And I know that human beings do this all the time, but I never understood it. But, you know, I don't believe you can say the Nazis did it in the name of Christianity. I think that oh, you can Oh, the, fir well, the first European power to sign, a, to sign a concordat with Hitler was the Pope. And I'm old enough to remember the Italian-Ethiopian War when the Pope of that church, which stands in Rome, sent out white Italian boys with his blessing to rape Ethiopia. But they also, you know, used to bless the Germans when they were going to rape the French, and the French when they were going to rape the Germans. Yes, that's I true. I mean, you're dealing with a period but yeah, when what, people yeah, blessed what I, But what I'm dealing with army. is the morality beneath all this. You also have to ask, where do you get your conception of morality? I get my conception of morality from where? From the way I watched... I get it partly from... Where indeed do I get it? It's Where do good, you get this? It's a good though, question. You see? But I don't get it from the Bible. You would never, not from the Bible, but from Christianity. I mean, after all, oh, where do we known. get our valuation of children? I have known a few Christians, but the first Christian I knew was my mother. She did something to all her children, which cost us a great deal, but it saved us too. And she, she somehow really made us believe that it was more important for us to love each other and love other people than, it, than anything else. Yeah, where you did know. you get that? You we see? got it from her. Yes. I did not get it from any preacher, and I did not get it from any church. Yeah, but this is just anti-establishment remarks. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I was a preacher. You know, I know I you was were, a preacher but I know what years. you gave it up. But just the same, you see, I think you have to look at part of the Western tradition, out of which, what conscience it has, out of which the impetus towards greater, towards peace and brotherhood and all of these things, they have come out of the ideas of Christianity, and we took them to India, and we took yeah, them to Japan. But, yeah, but what I insist on is that these ideas, in the relation, in, in, in respect, you know, to the lives of Black Americans or, or to the, all the all the great unwashed, had been always betrayed. Insofar as I can be called a Christian, I became a Christian by not imitating white people. Now, of course, that's a, that's a blanket statement because it, there are obviously white exceptions too. But if I try to become a Christian by imitating what what Christians did. I would be dead or a monster. I, be, I oh, became. But you could imitate your, what your mother did. 
I had to do that because I love my brothers and my sisters. In the long view, that is also part of an historical process. But what Christians seem not to do is to identify themselves with a man they call their savior, who after all was a very disreputable person when he was alive. And put to death by Rome, you know, helped along by the Jews, and, they, and everyone forgets that. So I, in my own case, in order to become a moral human being, whatever that may be, you know, I opted to say, hang out with publicans and sinners, you know, whores and junkies, and to stay out of the temple, you know, this is where they told us nothing but, but lies anyway. Yeah, but this is, of course, what Jesus did, too. Yes, but that's, it's only in that sense that I can be called a Christian. Yes, but you see, I'm not trying to call you a Christian. What I'm talking about is that what well, one I'll gets, the term what one not gets a, from I'm the not Christian Muslim. tradition. Yeah, well, well, yeah, but but that I everything that, that the good things that we have, the things you're insisting on, that people should love each other and recognize each other as brothers, that is a Christian idea. But it isn't only a Christian idea, isn't it? Also, a Muslim idea. No, Muslims don't believe in loving everybody as brothers. They only love Muslims as brothers. Well, they don't have really an idea. of of universal brotherhood, you know. Yeah. Uh, All right, I, I'll accept that. I don't know and that anyway, I mean, you can find it in Buddhism, but you didn't get it from Buddhism. No, that's, that's true. The point. That's true. You and but I, what we have in the belief in the brotherhood of man, of all men, or the power of love, we got out of the Christian tradition. Did we? I mean, I, I, at, the, at the risk of being difficult, I accept the premise. I know what you're saying. But did we? I wonder. It seems to me that you know, there are lots of ways to read the New Testament. And in my experience, no pope, except perhaps John the Twenty Third, can a, possibly well, have read it. Well, you see, John the Twenty Third, they suddenly they elected a Christian pope. I mean, it was a, yes, but it was a very odd thing. It was a very odd thing for Christians to do. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's my point. Yeah. You know, and what uh, what are those people then to be considered in the New Orleans parish? I don't want to belabor them either. But I cannot claim to have gotten anything from them except, you know, the object lesson. I suspect, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that out of any particular discipline, be it Christianity or be it Buddhism or, or be it, you know, um, LSD, God forbid. But I think that ultimately what happens is that if it does not become a matter of your personal honor, your personal private conviction, then it's simply just like you know, a cloak which you can wear or throw off. If it is not interiorized, as we would say Certainly. these days, then it really is meaningless. And in that sense, it seems to me the Christian church is meaningless. The Except Christian church as church. You know, the great thing about a church is it can breed heresies. Well, yes, that may be whereas what it's for. A, whereas a sect can't. Yes, know. that may be true. That may be true. Still, if I were a white Christian, I, well, I've, I've known some of my Christians, I mean, real ones. I, you know what I mean? That quite made me sound. I don't mean they're as rare as all that. But the ones I've known were always in trouble. And the last one I knew well had to leave the church in order to do what he felt he had to do. And what he was doing was something very simple and important. He was working with young kids in settlement houses up and down Manhattan. They have blacks and Puerto Ricans, and some of them were junkies. Well, he was doing what he could to rehabilitate, you know, to, in fact, to love for those children. And the parish priest has approved and, he had to, and kicked him out. Now, of course, it's a very trivial anecdote. But again, in the same way that, you know, the, Amer the American government's performance in Turkey is something which the Turks will remember, though I will forget. It is something, you know, the, the, the church's performance in, the, in, in that parish or in that ghetto is something the children will remember, though the priest may forget. You see what I mean? Of course, I can also see that this is one of the ways in which the world changes. So I'm not, I'm not being as vehemently uh, romantic or sentimental as I may sound. I understand that. I think I understand it, but I'm beginning to understand it. But it still seems to me a terrible crime to profess one thing and do another. You see, what I'm trying to get at, too, is that whether, for example, I am always rational or not is not as important a question as I used to think it was. No, well, I would like to think of myself as being a exceedingly rational human being. But no, that endeavor is what gave you my sense of humor. Because I know I'm not. <laughs> but what is important, and one of the elements that makes history, I think, is 
the reactions of human beings to their situation. And that reaction, when it's a real reaction, is always excessive and always a little blind. You simply find your situation intolerable and you set about to change it. And when you do that, you have placed yourself in a certain kind of danger, the danger of being excessive, the danger of being wrong, but it's the only way you ever learn anything. And it's also the only way the situation ever changes. That's certainly true. And one's got to deal with that, too. I may have reservations about, oh, I don't know, let's say Huey, because I love Huey. And you won't mind my using him this way. You know, I may, not, I may not agree with everything Huey says. You know, I may not think that Huey's always right. But I know what he means. And I know that he's learning all the time. I know that he means it and then he can listen. And I know that if I were 27 or 28, when I was 27 or 28, the situation was, my situation was, the situation objectively was different. But I was really, any, any black boy wants to live, begins to lash out, begins to fight, and you know, you, and really has to prepare himself to die. You cannot accept going through the world, you know, with covered with white people's spit. You know, Huey did it one way, I did it another. And no doubt we both made our, you know, our terrible mistakes. But that is the only way you, you have to tell the world how to treat you. If the world tells you how you're going to be treated, you're in trouble. That's part of what's happening, though. That's, That's what's happening. No. Yeah. I don't agree with all these people running around with Afro wigs. And God knows I'm tired of being told by people who just got out of you know, various white colleges and got, a, and got a dashiki and let their hair grow. I'm, t I'm terribly tired of you know, these middle class darkies telling me what it means to be black. But I understand why they have to do it. Well, and you know, it's really the poor middle class white man is having a horrible time. Because first he had the boys, that, the white boys that let their hair grow and made them look like girls and that upsetting. <laughs> then he gets the afro haircut where the hair stands straight up on their head and is threatening. It makes them all look like boys. Issue, you know? <laughs> yeah. All these black boys. So they, they've had it from both sides. It's really rough. It is rough indeed. But you know, they brought it be merciless. They brought it on themselves. I know that they couldn't help it. Well, who but brought it, it on themselves? The Cromwell's men when they cut off their hair? <laughs> no, I see your point. I know what you mean. From, you know. I know what you mean. But when I say they brought it on themselves, I'm, I'm deliberately taking a very, you know, I'm taking deliberately a very narrow view. I have to do it that way for the moment because I know one thing. I'm 46, okay. And whatever's happened to me, has happened to me. And that's all right. It doesn't make any difference now. But I have a great nephew who is two years old. And he is not going to live the life I've had to live. If it demands blowing up the Empire State Building, or whatever it demands, I will not be a party to it twice. In a sense, that's my real frame of reference. Though I know exactly what you mean and I agree with it. But uh, a two-year-old kid, though I know he is an historical figure, he is not an historical figure for me. Well, I have to give him whatever it is I can give him. But um, I don't think that mediocrities which appear to rule this country now have any right whatever to tell him where to sit and where to stand and who he is and what he's going to become, but I won't let them do it. Really, it's as simple as that. Well, how do you explain this? Or maybe you haven't heard about it because there was an episode about a month ago in Chicago, and they'd started some new program in which the cops were going to communicate with I the people. I heard about this, yeah. And a cop was killed by a sniper. Now, this is pretty dangerous. And the next week, on their own free will, the cops went back into that project where there could have been a sniper on any roof. How do you explain it at all? I think that in Chicago, for example, in Chicago, Chicago is a very good example, I think that by now some of the policemen and some, and some, of, the, and some of the people in authority have begun to realize that, that the gravity, the, you know, the really extreme gravity of, of that situation, the south side of Chicago is, in a, is really a pretty appalling place. And, um, some policemen must have begun to realize that you simply cannot go around cowing the natives, that the natives have a, have a real grievance, and furthermore, there are many millions of them. But it's a long way.
from realizing this, you know, and approving the steps to do things. Yeah. To going out there and risking your own skin when you don't have to. Martin Luther King went places where he knew he might be killed, always. Yes. Uh, the small children in integration in the yes. South knew what might happen to them. They went. Now, when you're getting this on both sides, and especially from a rather unlikely spot, from the police force as we've known it, I find this a little hard to explain. You see, you've got to have a, you've got to postulate a moral force on the other side, otherwise people oh, wouldn't but have not, that courage. But I'm, but I'm not, I'm they not, wouldn't have that courage. Yeah, but I accept that. A great deal of what I say, I leave myself open, I suppose, to a vast amount of misunderstanding, because a great deal of what I say is based on an assumption which I hold and don't always state. My fury about people is, is, is based precisely on the fact that I consider them to be responsible moral creatures. Yes. Who, 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 who so often do not act that way. But I'm not surprised when they do. I'm not that, that wretched a pessimist. I wouldn't indeed sound the way I sound yeah. if I didn't expect what I expect from human beings. If I didn't have some ultimate faith and love, faith in them and love for them. Because oh. I'm a human being too, and I have no right really to stand in judgment on the world as though I'm not a part of it. But what I'm demanding of other people is what I'm, is what I'm demanding of me. And but, you see, I see. I think you have to expand it to realize that there are things happening on both sides of the lines that have been drawn. Oh, I know that. I've watched it. Too, I've lived too long and too hard a life and been saved by too many improbable people not to realize that. It, it is a very serious question at present, you see, whether people say that there's been so much more p polarization. There is a... Well, I, I'm not entirely no, misled no. by the way things seem things. to be. Because they're so played you know, up. You you know. Know, and, uh, yes, I know that. Because I, But I, I always think, too, that there is every force creates a counterforce. You know, and the polarization one is speaking of has also driven some people much closer together. together. And it's had the advantage, in any case, of making things much clearer. Then it is much, much harder to fool yourself about the situation in this country now no. than it was even five years yes, ago. Sir. Now one knows, if you have any sense at all, any eyes at all, you can see where we are and how grave the danger is. Now we're still waiting. Each town is waiting for its own riot. Its own holocaust. Before it does anything. Uh, we're doing exactly what happened in World War II in England. Those cities that didn't get bombed were lax in all their precautions, you know. Yes. And little cracks of light were showing and fire yeah. watchers weren't working. And people went around saying, what this city needs is a good bomb. Well, that's what we've been waiting for, that everybody. That one of the reasons, I think, that we've had as much violence as we've had is, in a sense, the people who should have been on the other side, or one would expect to be, who wanted something to happen, and didn't have any way of making anything happen. Yeah. And so they in syrup, no, not syrup just isn't the right word because they weren't conscious, but unconsciously fed the violence. Yeah. So that the violence would produce some kind of change. Would, would, would produce, would, Certainly yeah. has happened on college campuses. Yes, it's true. That's true. The effect of the violence, of course, has been to par to paralyze a great deal of the American people, great, who simply don't know what it, who can't face what it means. I think it's very bad only to respond to violence and not, not respond long before there's violence. Yes, but, but the, alas, most people, in the, especially in the case of the black-white situation in this country, most white people until, until this hour, and for complexer reasons, which there may be no purpose in going into, partly willfully and partly out of genuine ignorance you know, and lack of imagination, really do not know why black people are in the streets. And God knows the mass media doesn't really help to clarify this at all. Every time you see a ra ride, you know, you see all these people stealing TV sets and, and, uh, and looking like savages, according to, you know, the, the silent majority's optic. And if you don't know why they're in the streets, especially with various uh, Ivy League colleges and arrow collar ad men and, and all the symbols and tokens of, of progress, so that what, there's a danger of another polarization, at least on the surface, because the white American and, and the world you know, looks at, let us say, um, Harry Belafonte, who's an arbitrary, f famous public figure, yes. and, uh, and those people riding the South Side, and they conclude, as they're meant to conclude, really, that if uh, those people on the South Side washed themselves or straightened up, they could all, all be Harry Belafonte. Yeah. You know, that there's nothing wrong with the system, there's something wrong with the people. And of course, this is the greatest illusion and delusion, the most dangerous delusion of all. Because, of course, that exacerbates the rage of the, of the people trapped in the ghetto. They know why they're there, if Ameri even if America doesn't. Well, you know, Detroit, um, there were so many people saying there wasn't going to be any trouble in Detroit. Why? Because Detroit had the, the 
Negroes had done better in Detroit than any other city. There were a lot of rich people. Now, Detroit was one of the worst riots because yes. there were people black people who own yachts and the Cadillacs and all that. Yeah, I said to you the, the yeah. other day, the black people who hate white people most uh, are not the people on the level of the porter, but, 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 but the, you know, what we have to call the black middle class, because yeah. they're the closest to, you know, the American aspirations, and by far the most frustrated. But also, um, you see, the poor, I think, as long as they could believe that if some of the, some of the barriers were removed, they could have a yacht, that which was, in a sense, a symbol of, of education yes. and the... And acceptance. You know, the cotton-picking parents who sent 10 yeah. children to school in yeah. 1939. That's right. That's right. They thought those children just get an education and a little relaxation and they could get there. Yeah. Well, now, young people in this country, the poor, black or white, know that they can never get there. Yes, which in, which, every day on which in a way, in front of them. which in a way is very healthy. I've never really accepted the, the you know the notion that the, the achievement of a Cadillac or a yacht meant anything at all, except perhaps convenience. No, I've always had a quarrel with this country about not only about race but about but about the standards which by which it appears to live. People are drowning in things; they don't even know what they what they want them for. They're absolutely useless, and the kids hate them. It's now beginning to be evident because the kids can't live with them at all. You know what in the world? You can't, you can't sleep with a yacht, or you can't make love to a Cadillac. Everyone appears to be trying to. The great emotional or psychological or, or, or affective lack of love and touching, I think, is the key to the American or even the Western disease. Well, I think probably more here. But well, here it is the most exaggerated but form. But people who came here, most of the people who came here were terribly poor and wanted things. There were all these people who thought they were coming to a land where the streets were paved with gold. And that is the reason they came. We've got an enormous number of people in this country who didn't come here to dream. Yeah. Didn't have dreams. Except just security for their children. And these are the people who, that we call the silent majority. And they're terribly frightened. Yes, their fear and frightens terribly me. terribly easy to frighten. Their fear is frightening. I well, all fear is frightening. And certainly all groups yeah. that are frightened are frightening. Because it may be that their fear will, will precipitate the kind of social chaos which no society can really survive. So survive, that's right. It seems to be very likely even. The apathy with which everything... See, I don't think there's so much apathy. I think there's enormous lack of knowledge of what to do about anything. Now, there's an enormous sense of frustration and people feel so much in this country that you ought to be able to fix anything at once. You know, press a button and something happened. Then they try to manage our political system or our economic system, which is just as bad. You know, you can't buy a tape recorder that works by any chance. <laughs> you buy one that isn't right and you send it back and they send it back again. You spend six months getting it adjusted. Everybody in the country is in a state of frustration about something. I think irritation rather than apathy is much more important here now. Everybody is irritated, their skin sort of scratchy. Um, and this makes them, now we, we always talk about if the temperature goes up too high in summer, there'll be trouble. But this is, this is irritation that is the, is the rising temperature. Apathy I don't think is the word anymore for what's happening. I don't think people are apathetic in New York when they see somebody attacked on the street. I think they just plain don't know what to do. They don't know whether they get killed themselves. And we had a lovely episode of a sailor from somewhere who, of a gang of kids were going to attack a girl. And he was a sailor from the backwoods of somewhere. He just went in and stopped them. Uh, but the average New Yorker doesn't know what to do. You know, they, uh, the people who've had no contact, the average middle class who've had no contact with violence really at all. Now, I watched um, a scene through a one-way grass cut once where they were testing a very dangerous 15-year-old boy. I mean, everybody knew he was pretty dangerous, and the psychologist was testing him and had a whole set of um, things laid out on the table, including a hammer that size, which was ridiculous to have had there. Mm -hmm. All of us were sitting on the other side of the screen, and he knew that pe there were people on the other side of the screen. The boy knew it. The boy knew, because this is honesty. He was spending his time playing with the idea that he might throw that hammer through the screen. 
Now, everybody else in that room was frightened except me, because I knew I could dodge that hammer. And I've lived among people who don't have shields. They just dodge, they catch them, they catch the spears or dodge them. Mm -hmm. And if you, you can dodge, mm -hmm. you know, the time it picks them up, uh, pick a hammer up, you can dodge. But nobody else in the room knew they could dodge. And they were just paralyzed. And I think a lot of the yeah. country is paralyzed uh, with the lack of knowledge of what in the world to do. Now their children are being, for a long time, it was only, only black children who are being menaced and slaughtered. But now white children are being slaughtered, no, are menaced and being slaughtered too. Well, now let's, and let's, that gives us, brings us to Kent State. Now for I, example, I Kent would State. like to relate to you a discussion in my class, one of my classes, and mm -hmm. have you comment on it, the mm -hmm. cold. One of the students said promptly, uh, this was after Kent State and before, no, after Kent State, after Jackson, and the next week. See, and they said, everybody got excited about Kent State. Then they went back to the, that previous massacre in Orange. In Orange, I guess. And nobody was excited then. And now that white kids are being killed, white people are excited. Now, I said, and now that black kids are being killed, and Jackson, you're excited. Now, if it is right for you to, to be more interested and care more about the Jackson kids. They weren't any of them caring about the white kids at Kent State. Only point they were making was that when the kids were killed at Orangeburg, this was the earlier discussion, nobody cared. And I said, you cared. Everybody they meant the country, they meant the country wait, didn't the care. The country didn't care. The black people in the country cared. Then we have white kids killed and the white people in the country care. Then we have more black kids killed and the black people in the country care. Now, I don't think you can blame people for caring more or being more vividly caught when someone that, who might have been their child is killed. Then, you know, one way or the other, if black people are going to care more about Jackson State, and they did, a lot more, then you've got to expect that white people are going to care more about white kids. Now, yeah, but I you don't see, because you identify the country with the whites. Now, just before you, you blow up on this, <laughs> Then I said, and what, after they'd had it hammer and tongs on this, this line for a bit, what about the Italians that are picketing the FBI as being unfair to Italians because they're persecuting the mafia? This is one of the cases when you're glad for a third case. Now, you know, they, yeah. they were over making an overriding ethnic identity that was more important to them than whether, whether they were robbers or not. Yeah. Um, I don't think you can call the country the same thing. There were a lot of people that were upset about Kent State and Jackson. And there were a lot of people that were upset about Orangeburg. Now, who are the conscience of the country? Now, the conscience of the country has only a certain voice. People are only really going to be affected immediately if something touches them that they can imagine and understand. And Isn't so when we say, sure, it spreads from the inner city to the suburbs, and then people get excited. But well, the reason point, the but inner city's excited is because they see what's happening to their kids. They're there. Yes, but my point is not so much, uh, not only that, that uh, white people got upset about Kent State, more about white kids being killed than about uh, black kids being killed. That, in a way, is sinister enough. I mean, what is most sinister for me is that they cared so little. I'm not objecting that they, that they cared too much. I'm objecting, that they, I'm, I'm objecting that, they, that they didn't care enough. About Kent State. About Kent State. They cared enough to do a hell of a lot of lying. A lot of lying. Lying. Oh, the, the Yeah, well, of course, that's part of the course, too, well, isn't it? Well, you see, yeah. when, what you have to think about is there was a terrific distortion of the Kent State thing, you know, as it was when it was being something to care about. Everybody did not discuss the fact the guard had been on there being battled with for three days. Yeah. And, and that the kids that were in that crowd are the ones that had burned the ROTC building down. That was all schematicized so that you had as bad a schematization as anyone who we've ever discussed is what they do when they're discussing a black-white situation. It was totally schematicized. This, I think, is a serious thing in this country, the inability to look at the whole situation. And every time anybody is partisan on any side. Yeah, but this comes back, you, s you described before, as the fact that the world has become unmanageable and institutions that cannot respond to the real needs of the society. Well, you, we have the choice now 
right this minute, of people putting their energies into trying to control the technological system so that it's workable for human beings, or putting their energies into romantic notions of anarchy and revolution. Yeah, but that's, that, that's, that, that would be... It's a real choice. Yeah, but the second choice is obviously is obviously disastrous. You know. It's a, a disastrous with what's happening. I know that I know what's happening. That's why I'm frightened. Because it's very difficult to ask people to give up the assumptions by which they've always lived. And yet that's the demand one's got to make now of everybody. Because the assumptions by which we've all lived so far of everybody, including the don't romantic work. assumption that revolution will work without a new design. Oh, I was revolutionary at fifteen. I gave that up at the same time I left the church. <laughs> I'm another kind of revolutionary now, if I'm a revolutionary at all. I might even be described as a conservative in terms of the things that I think about and want to see honored and, and made viable for, people, for people's lives. But I do know that we are surrounded by poverty and rage. And I know how explosive a formula that is. Yes. That has nothing whatever to do with reason, nothing, nothing whatever to do with human charity, it has to do with human need. And human needs have, will, will find some way of, make, of expressing themselves even if they can't find some way of, make, of, make, of being met. But you see, you see, there's a, a little bit of a contradiction because you talk about all the kindness and generosity among the poor. Now, th there is generosity and kindness among the poor when they think nothing can be done about it, on the whole. This is true. And when they think something can be done about it, then it's, they're using their energy getting mad. Yes, and trying, yes, trying and to change things. Trying to change things. And that's yes. what we have now, I think. Whereas when you were growing up, most of the people you knew were pretty resigned to the fact that life was going to be hard. If you got educated, maybe you'd get out of it, but it was hard. No, there wasn't the hope or dream of as much of a change as there is now, do you think? For individuals, yes, but for everybody. That's a serious question. I'd have to, I'd have to think back. No, there was a, yes, it's true. There was a kind of resignation. The whole style yes. came out of a certain kind of resignation, which is gone forever. I think so. No. Even people who got educated realized they were still in a trap. And I knew too many people who had been to college who were you know, shuffling around with garbage cans mm. to be fooled about what education would do. And now it is very different. It is very different because the image of the black people have of themselves is, is, is utterly changed. And it's changed because of objective reasons. It's changed because the world has changed. It's changed because one has seen on television black leaders. No, it's changed because the power of white people to control my mind has been broken. And that is a very important shift. That is perfectly true. No one growing up now has, a, has before him the vista that I have when I was growing up. No. But that increases the poverty and the rage, though, paradoxically, well, doesn't it, does. it? Oh, certainly. And therefore the danger. And therefore the danger. Well, that's where we are, though. That's, that's where we are, and it's where, in a sense, TV has brought us, because it's brought everybody's way of life available to into everybody. The, into America's living room. Oh, yes. God, that living room. Well, you know, we seem simply to be confronted with enormous questions, it's just as really these hideous buildings outside your window. There they are. What should we do with them? Because they're still not fit for human habitation for the most part. But, you know, we're very short of living space. We really, at the moment, can't afford to dispense with any of it. One of the greatest crimes against New York City are the landlords that have let buildings go so yes, that I know. we've I lost 100,000 dwelling units in New York City. Now that, is, that is, now, that is the fault of the system, you know. One has been avoiding the word capitalism, and you know, one has been avoiding talking about matters on that level. But there is a very serious flaw in the, in, in the profit system, which is implicit in the, in the phrase itself. And in some way or another, that, that one, can, one could even say, that, that at this moment sitting in this room, that the Western economy, one of the, certainly part of the crisis of the Western economy, is, is due to the fact, in a way, every dime I earn, the system which earns it for me, quite apart from whatever, I don't mean, I don't mean the fact that I write books, but the way the system works. Yeah. We're standing on the back of some black miner in South, in South, in South Africa, okay. and he is going to stand up presently. Now, if we don't anticipate that, we will be in terrible trouble. Huh. He is not going to be bending under this weight right. 10 years from now. No. And if we don't understand that and let him stand up, then the whole thing is going to be a shambles. I agree. But I think also, if we don't understand that the systems that are call themselves private power or public planning, if they don't learn to think ahead further... Yes, I know. ...and include all human beings... That's, that's of course... That's they are of course contributing to the shambles. 
Yes, this is this is the cause. My, this, that's the cause of my point. I don't see this moment how we're going to avoid it. One day South Africa will blow up. It's as certain as death. Let me be reckless and go back to where we really ended. I remember now we were talking about the South African miner and the fact that the Western economy, this shirt I'm wearing, and the dress you're wearing, not your fault and it's not my fault. The economy is so based, so built, that it is based standing on the back of some nameless black miner in Johannesburg. And as we said this afternoon, one day he will stand up. When he stands up, what's on his back will crumble. And what shall we do? We cannot prevent him standing up. That is not among our possibilities. He will stand up. How can we minimize the damage on him and on well, us? us? When he stands up? Yes, because he will. How should we manage that day? The historical point of view will not help us then. Now you see. What you think or what I think will not help us then. then. What matters is what we do now. Now, yes, before what then. What shall we do? Before then. How shall we liberate that man and us? Because that liberation is a double liberation. The life of my two-year-old great-nephew depends on that liberation. And so does the life of your children depend on that liberation. Yes. How should we achieve that liberation? Yes. Now, I'm going to shift for a minute because the piece of this Yes, you know, go on. It seems to me the kids who are denying history, you know, saying it's irrelevant, they don't know anything Well, about, kids don't, don't know anything, anything about history. Well, they don't know enough to argue with the adults. And they know that they know things the adults don't know. Yes. But if they venture into the field of history, the adults will put them down every time because they've been there. So they just no, say... No, 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 if I may interrupt you for a moment. You used two difficult words here. Adults, well, it's a difficult word. Well, pre-World War II. No, adults are Who rare. Are still old. Adults are rare. Adults are rare. All right, grown-ups. You like that? Too? Yeah. What are you going to call Adults are rare. Most people are grown-up children. All right. Well, then let's and history is a concept which exists in nearly nobody's mind. Yes, but now... Is that true or not? You see, you see, well, you if see you make it that you way, see what I'm, trying to I'm get talking at. about something else, you see. I'm talking All right, go on. What I'm talking about is that the kids, say, refuse to pay attention to anything that happened before. And they just say it's irrelevant. It has nothing to do with now. We're talking about now. What about Mr. Agnew? Mr. Agnew doesn't know any history, but he quotes it. He doesn't refuse it. The kids do. They refuse. Oh, Mr. Agnew, to use him, you know, it's a very bad example. But we're living in a rather bad example. I will go back to where I was two days ago. Luckily, I'm not 15. But if I were, and listen to Spiro T. Agnew. And again, I'm talking about the office and not necessarily the man, if the man exists. How in the world would I achieve any respect for human life or any sense of history? I'm, I'm trying to say that if I were young, I would find myself with no models. Who wants to be spiritual Agnew? That's right. That's a very crucial situation. For that man, who wants to be George Pompidou? When you consider what we have done, our generation, the world that we have created, if I were 15, I would feel hopeless, too. But Jimmy, you... You see, what one's got to do is try to face... What I'm trying to get at is... I read a little book in Istanbul called The Way It's Supposed to Be. And it was poetry and things written by little black children, Mexican, Puerto Rican children, in various schools in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And the teacher, who no longer was a teacher, had made a compilation of the poetry his kids wrote. And he let them talk. He respected them. He dealt with them as though they were, in fact, as in fact all children are, as all human beings are, a kind of miracle. And because he did that, something happened. And for me, that very tiny book, it's about 30 pages long. One boy wrote a poem, 16 years old, he was in prison. It ended with four lines I'll never forget. Walk on water. Walk on a leaf, hearts of all is walking grief. What I'm getting at, I hope, is that there is a tremendous national, moral, global waste. And the question is, how can it be arrested? That's the enormous question. Look, you and I are both whatever we have become. And whatever happens to us now does not really matter. The curtain will come down eventually. But what should we do about the children? Yeah. We are responsible, insofar as we're responsible yeah. at all, 
We have, to, we have to assume that we are responsible for the future yeah. of this world. Yeah. That's right. What shall we do? How shall we begin it? How can it be accomplished? How can one invest others with some hope? We've been talking about time present and time past. God knows, you know, I'm, I'm not least interested in carrying on the nightmare. Nevertheless, if I don't, I, Jimmy, don't accept this very brutal fact, which is not extraordinary. It's happened to everybody else in the world, too. But if I pretend it did not happen to me, that I was not there, then I cannot live. That's what I mean by history being present. I don't mean that I got a, a bill to pay back or that... Um, but you did use the word atonement. You used the word... Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. The Holy Ghost. You yes. used the word... Well, then, couldn't then be let forgiven. me say exactly what I mean by that. If I, Jimmy, really offend you, Margaret, and I pretend I haven't, I have sealed my life off from all life, all light, and all air. I will not get past my crime if I pretend I did not commit it. I agree with if that. If I about have offended us. you, then I have to come to you and say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm only talking about that. And if I can't do that, then I cannot live. Yes, you see, I I'm not talking about crime and punishment. But you see, I agree with all this about you and me now, and what, but what, I and the this children in the future. Mm -hmm. But if you take the past, all but right, the past my is my the present. Wait a minute, my ancestors were hunted through the caves of Scotland and tortured, and I know. Uh, should I go back now and and have I'm not a talking about going. With I'm not talking about going back. Yeah, nobody, but, but nobody can anyway. No, but you we were are, talking the about... The framework is the American civilization, isn't it? Yes, and my ancestors and my were hunted through caves before they got here, too. Yes, but... But I don't think it's particularly relevant except what I heard as a child. Yes, but my ancestors also had a curious history and were penalized and are penalized for it here. You're not penalized, Jimmy, for your history. Oh, yes, it's written what on my you're, brow. No, you're not. You're pe what you're being penalized for is the ridiculous attitude, and you can find it places with totally different histories, European notions of superiority. We're both exiles. But we ha No, I'm not an exile because I'm an American who goes abroad. I'm not an exile. Well, I am an exile. But I was an exile long before I went away, because the terms, this is the point, the terms on which my life was offered to me in my country Weren't good enough were entirely, no, not good enough, entirely intolerable and unacce unacceptable. unacceptable. Right. My country drove me out. The Americans drove me out of my country. But you've never left in spirit. This is what my people in New Guinea said, you see. All taxes all were abolished because the notion was that taxes were back to the salt mines and with the general African model. And then my New Guinea people elected to pay taxes because they said, otherwise, we cry to the government. And we don't want to cry to the government. We will pay taxes and ask for what is our right. We did that on a famous day in Washington. When Martin I Luther was King there. Gave the, I have a dream. Yes. yes. And do you know the answer we got? Two weeks later, 10 days later, out of that enormous petition. You know the first answer that the Republic gave us? My phone rang one morning. I was back in Hollywood, God knows why. And a core worker was telling me she could hardly talk. That four black girls have been bombed into eternity in a Sunday school in Birmingham. That was the answer the Republic gave. But you see, I would say that the Republic did not give that answer because I'm part of the Republic and I didn't give it. I'm not and accusing. And this is the thing I'm I am not accusing you. Wait a minute. Well, who, I am what, accusing the Republic. What's the Republic? You can't accuse an entity like the Republic. My countrymen. Well, now, who are you accusing, though? My a conquered nation. Now, wait a minute. 
You see, this is the My thing. countrymen. Which countrymen? My countrymen. Yeah, all of them? All of them. All right, that includes me. Includes me, too. Did you bomb those little girls in Birmingham? I'm responsible for it. I didn't stop Why it. Why are you responsible? Didn't you try to stop <coughs> it? Hadn't you been working? It doesn't make any difference what one's tried. Of course it makes a difference what one's tried. Not really. Tried. No, well, you see, you're... This is... No. Now, this is a fundamental difference. You're talking like a Greek Orthodox. You're talking exactly like a Greek Orthodox. That we're all guilty because some man suffers no, murder. No, no, no. We are all responsible. Look, you're not responsible. That blood for is also on my hands. Why? Because I didn't stop it. All right. Is the blood of somebody who's dying in Burma today on your hands? Yes. You didn't stop that. That's what yes. I mean by the Greek Orthodox. Yes. Position. And I will not accept it. We talked earlier about poverty and rage. I am one of the dispossessed. There is that difference. According to the West, I have no history. There is that difference. That I have had to wrest my identity out of the jaws of the West. It's a very different endeavor because we've been told nothing but lies. So if you've been told nothing but lies. That's right, we've but, both been told But about. there's a difference in that. That's your whether, identity. One, whether one was the lied about or not. You identify with, with angels and I'm identified with the devil. We're living in a kind of theology. Therefore, my situation is our situation, really. But my situation presents itself to me exceedingly urgent. I cannot lie to myself about some things. I cannot. I don't mean that anybody else is his. I mean that I have to know something about myself and my countrymen. The most terrible thing about it is not the lynchings of fire and the burning, the bombing. That's bad enough. What is really terrible is to face the fact that you cannot trust your countrymen, that you cannot trust them. That the assumptions in which they live are antithetical to any hope you have, may have to live. It is a terrible moment when you see an American flag on somebody's car and realize that's your enemy. In principle, it's your flag too. But the man who's flying the American flag is going to kill you. You, his brother. You, his countrymen. That's what that flag means. You ask any Southeast Asian if you doubt me. That is a bitter pill. But it is like that. I'm not denying any of these facts. What I'm trying to consider is whether there is an inevitable difference in the spiritual stance. We can't talk about the spiritual stance unless you talk about power. I'm talking about power. I'm talking about that South African miner on whom the entire life of the Western world is based. Well, I'm just sorry, because it isn't only based on that South African miner. It's based on miners in this country and miners in Britain it's that the are same, underground. It's the same principle. It isn't the same principle as long as you're going to make continually make it racial. I'm not being racial. Well, you are being racial. I, pre I present you. Charles Dickens briefly. talked about the kids being dragged through mines long before they've discovered me. That's right. But, you know, we're not having a rational conversation. We're talking about the profit motive. We're not. We weren't. <laughs> Look, I was talking. Cut it off. You said if it's power, if it's a difference in power. So I said, okay. You Look, reverse let me put it, it this if way. If you reverse it, what I feel is this. We agree that we're both Americans. We agree in a sense of responsibility for the present and the future. You have approached this present moment by one route, and I have approached it by another. In the terms of, in our colors of our skin, you represent a, a course of victimization and suffering, and exploitation and everything in the world. We can make any number that and I represent the group, now wait a minute, if you just use skin color, I represent the group that were the, in the ascendancy, were the conquerors, had the power, owned the land, you can say anything you like. Right now, here we both are. Now, furthermore, however, I do not represent, and I never have been a part in the whole of my life, 
because of the accidents of my upbringing and so forth, of the kind of psychology that would perpetuate this. You also have moved around, have lived in many parts of the world, and although you completely understand what happens here, but you've included a lot of other things in your psyche. Now, is it necessary for you to, to narrow history, and I still want to think this is a phrase, and express only despair or bitterness, while I express hope, and is this intrinsic to our position at the moment, or can we both of us, out of such a different past and such a different experience and a contemporarily different experience, because you, in your own country, wherever you go, are likely to meet with insult, with indignity. Danger. Uh, uh, yeah. Whereas wherever I go, on the whole, they haven't heard me say I was in favor of marijuana, I'm greeted with, on the whole, kindness. So that contemporaneously, your experience and mine will continue to be different. Now, given that fact, can we both nevertheless stand shoulder to shoulder a continent or an ocean away, working for the same future? Now, I think this is the real problem. I don't think that's Or do we have to work on it differently? I don't so think that's a problem at all. I take that, you know, your supposition about being shoulder to shoulder. I take that as a fact. Yes, but you see, you and I, I said earlier we both were exiles and you, and you said we weren't. But you are, because of what you know. I am what? <coughs> An exile. Oh, no. The mainstream of the life of this country. I'm not an exile. I am absolutely not an exile. I live here, and I live in Samoa, and I it's live in New Guinea. I live everywhere on this planet that I've ever been. And then I'm you no mean exile. that you refuse to accept the condition of being an exile? What? I what? You refuse to accept the condition. No, it is just not. <coughs> it really isn't meaningful to me to say that, you see. I'm not an exile. I accept the condition of man, the condition of man at this present state, and the condition of man where I live, and the point of greatest responsibility for that. But I'm no exile. I'm at home. I can't say that. And you can't say this. You know, this is, this is one of the dramatic points of difference. I'm not at home. Anywhere on this planet. Forever. Hmm? Forever. I'm not like you in one way. Can you think of a world no. future where you'd be at home? The future doesn't exist for me. But it could change your present if you could think of it. No, I am not romantic. I am not at home here and never will be. That means that I will never, 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 as long as I live, be at home. Anywhere in the world. Because you're not at home here. Because my countrymen, because my own. countrymen have rejected me. In the terms of their acceptance, I will not accept. No power under heaven, or under the sea, or beneath hell, ever allow me to take my place in this particular pantheon. I reject it in toto. From the virgin birth of the alabaster Christ. In toto. And it brought nothing but death and misery to me and mine. How? And I intend to change it. But how? I don't know yet. You see, I mean, that's the next question. Oh, that's the question I live with. But you keep talking about the possibility that the Western world doesn't meet its the ethic of the present. It will go down. There's no it will go down. The whole planet will go down. That may happen. It is crucial at the present moment in history. What the Western world does is crucial. You say because history. You say history. I say time. All right. Present time. I'm very willing to see either one. But it just happens that either the United States or the Soviet Union, and possibly rather soon China, 
could destroy the entire planet. This is our crucial... If we want those children, if we want this nephew of yours of whom you spoke so movingly and identified with the future of all children, if we want them here, it is absolutely essential that we recognize that the Soviet Union and the United States, either one of us, could destroy the world. And that we're not going to have a world made up of Mexico and Vietnam with Russia and the United States eliminated. It's unrealistic. We've got, well, the change has got to occur here, within but this country and within the Soviet Union and in China. But it won't. Hmm? But it won't. Well, then why are you it alive? Won't. Why do you stay alive one day? Well, something will come after it. Well, but if not, not on this planet. America is not about to change. Wait a minute. Not on this planet, then. I mean, if America... D I'm committed to the human race, but I know that America will not change. However paradoxical that may sound, however contradictory that may sound. This ignorant people and so you have yet to discover... And so you'll contribute to it's not changing. Oh, what That's what you're doing now, you see. Not in the, uh, your earlier books. But now you're contributing to its not changing and to the destruction of all human life on this planet. No. Yes, you are. I don't think so. Well, you mean you think... But I cannot be deluded about the people whom I know, best of all the people you, on the do earth. Do you think if you tell them they won't change, they will? Are you just trying to provoke them into better behavior? Somebody said, Allen Ginsberg said, you know, don't call the cop a pig. Call him a friend. If you call him a friend, he'll act like a friend. I know more about cops than that. Which cops? All you don't know cops. anything. You don't know anything about the young college people that are going into the cops today. I know, about, I know a lot about the colleges. I'm sorry, you don't know <laughs> a thing in the world about the young college people that are going in and going into a a tough situation with a tough ethos, trying mm -hmm. to change it. Mm -hmm. And what you know about the what colleges I is do not wrong. Know, what I do know is that I do not like to be corralled. I don't like being a subject nation. That I do know. Yes, you know what you And do. I don't care how well the cops are educated. I know what their role is in my life. And I will not accept it. Yes, but how are you going to change it? Blow it up. That changes I don't care nothing. what happens. You turn into a cop just mm -hmm. like them after you kill them. I know that too. <laughs> but I know that my situation cannot be endured. It cannot be endured. But what? And if I turn into a monster by trying to change it, that is something a risk my soul will have to take. I am not being objective. No, I don't think you should be. I'm trying to say this. I don't think I'm being objective either. No, I know you're not. You shouldn't be. No, I'm speaking out you of the passion of what I believe yes, in. Precisely. Now, we've got to make some kind of connection between what you believe and what I have endured. I'm not using you as Margaret or me as Jimmy. Yeah. But you really must consider seriously, I think, the state of a nation in which I, Jimmy, or I historically, am forced to say, I do not care what the presumed facts are. I cannot afford to care. But you see, the I significant don't. thing is, is that sentence, I cannot afford to care. And that's what I've been talking about all along. That Maybe you can't afford to care. Now, and I can. Now, is, what is the difference between the people who cannot afford to care about the facts and those who can? And that's a real difference. The difference is that you, generically, historically, write the facts, which I am expected to believe. The difference is that you, historically, generically, have betrayed me so often lied to me so long that no number of facts, according to you, will ever convince me. And if that's so, the world is doomed. That because if we can't reach a point where everybody in this world can understand that's facts. But I'm talking to you. Wait, I know. Which is the best the country at the moment can afford. You don't exist in the country either, oh, yes. any more than I do. Oh, yes, I do. Jimmy, that won't go. Well, that let me put just it, won't go. Then let me put it another way. You and I are both in the same very difficult hot seat. America doesn't want you any more than it wants me. 
Jimmy, it isn't true that we've got to face the fact that isn't true. Oh, you think I'm popular here? No, but I am. You think so? Yes. Well, you're tough. No, I, be <laughs> I, I belong here. You, you know. So now, do you I. I know, but you are at the moment feel your belongingness is non-existent. So you make an, a different step. Now we've got to face when we've got to face that fact, and we've got to face the fact that you say that the. the n Truth will never matter to you anymore. I didn't say truth, I said facts. Well, facts. But remember, I've, I've, that when I'm talking, I'm talking about actuality. I've defined what I mean. I'm talking about real facts. It seems to me your key sentence there was, I cannot afford no, I can't. to care about the facts. Even if no, they're true. No, I cannot afford to believe you. I don't mean you. Yeah, all right. Now, wait a minute. No, the real issue is, can you afford to believe me? I now, do just, wait a minute. Just consider this for a minute. I Not do believe can you, you. can you afford to believe me. Now, maybe you can't, you see? I mean, I yes, think this you, is I the real issue. I see what you're saying. Then let, let, me, then let me say this. Yeah. You're nothing that, you know, that we've done these last, what, 48 hours, whatever it was. If I did not believe you, I couldn't talk to you at all. But uh, isn't Wait, that the answer? Wait a moment. That's the beginning of the question. I, I, Jimmy, I trust you with me and mine. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the state of the nation. But don't you think this is part of the state of the nation? That you can trust me even though you have Shaking the dust of the country it, off it, your feet. Oh, I will never be able to shake the dust of the city off my feet. I'm not romantic, as I said before. I have a lot of work to do, and I have to find a way of doing it. That's my problem, and nobody else's. And there are no excuses. If I have to go to Tokyo to do it, or you know, find a cave to do it, I have to do it, and I'll find a way to do it. It doesn't make any difference where I find it or what I, or what I do, as long as I do it. That is all that matters there. I trust you. That is not the point. The country doesn't trust you or me. That is the point. See, I don't think that's true. Well, you see, I don't well, think it's true. Well, there are enormous well, well, groups in well, this country that trust well, you and well, trust me. Well, well, and that may be enough to save the country. And maybe but it's not. a very recent, well, and we've agreed, haven't we? But that's all I'm trying to say. That that's look. I also breathe the air. I also want to live. I know very well that if you don't, we don't. They don't. I can't. That's what it's all about. But we have to achieve some kind of vocabulary. I must say, I think we've begun it. To tell you the truth, I think we've begun it translate to each other and then for many others you your experience and my experience because it isn't your experience does not matter as Margaret Mead and my experience doesn't matter as Jimmy Baldwin what does matter is what we can do with it not for you not for me but for all those people who don't know the discipline the passion the love you know, which goes into a vast amount of effort and what a vast amount of effort, how little it can produce. You're talking about time and history, and I am too. It takes a long, long time, doesn't it? You don't belong to you any more than I belong no. to me. No. We're talking about that. I have to talk out of my beginnings. And I did begin here, auctioned like a mule, red as though I were a stallion. I was in my country, which I paid for, and I'm paying for. Treated as not even a beast is treated. Died in ditches as not even a mule is murdered. And I have to remember that. I have to redeem that. I cannot let it go for nothing. The only reason I'm here is to bear witness. I don't really like my life. I don't really want another drink. I've seen enough of the world cities, you know, to make me vomit forever. But I've got something to do. 
There's nothing in it any longer for me. What I wanted is what everybody wanted. You wanted it too. Everybody wanted it. It will come. It comes in different shapes and forms. It's not despair. But the price one pays is everybody's price. But on top of that particular price, which is universal, there is something gratuitous which I will not forgive. It is difficult to be born, difficult to learn to walk, difficult to grow old, difficult to die, and difficult to live. Everybody, everywhere, forever. But no one has the right to put on top of that another burden, another price which nobody can pay, and a burden which really nobody can bear. I know it's universal, Margaret, but the fact that it's universal doesn't mean that I'll accept it. Cut it off.